in case you can't read that, that says at the bottom, the following text has been adapted from a selection of the final sentences of exhibition catalogues, uh, exhibition catalogue essays published by Modern Art Oxford in the last 25 years. I am a place of memory, a nothing, a void, something of the universe before birth or after destruction. I have created a space of immense creative possibilities, a chaotic space within which points of order, emotional and intellectual, are able to emerge. I remain a stage, or perhaps more aptly, a space of rehearsal in which my limits and possibilities are flagrantly disregarded and stringently tested. I illuminate, interrogate, and even on occasion patrol the disciplines, prejudices, ideas, and phenomena which lie at the heart of things. I refuse to either dispose of the past or pay simple homage to it. Rather, I challenge tradition as much as my lively surfaces push paint around. By doing this, I find startling ways to teach old masters new tricks. I negotiate the here and now. I do not refer to some visual space beyond, but instead fully embody my own physical presence, a state also required of you. a realignment of meaning somewhere outside the periphery of your lazy sight. While looking at me in the confines of your small space, your thoughts are focused entirely on the idea of absence and presence. In diverse ways, I reflect the changing conditions of contemporary perception and reopen my possibility, albeit in an inverted upside down and inside out way as an expression of a more actual experience of the present. The world I, con I construct is complex, poignant, frightening, and sometimes wondrous, but no more so than any of the worlds each one of you constructs from moment to moment as you create reality for yourselves. The difference is that I am able to translate the particulars of this intimate, deeply personal process into such clear and communicable presentation that I not only construct an ascertainable place for my private world in the realm of public discourse, but also propose to deconstruct your own personal realities as I do so. I suggest a more expansive status beyond the confines of medium in which my edge slips into the realm of the everyday world. Creative and social energies are released by my pioneering activities. I reveal a society devoted to a modern, modern paganism within a space permeated with utopianism and ideology. Like the early painted figures and forms that were designed to bring good fortune in a hunt or marital union, I perform our culture up differently so that you might dream a silvered image of the future that projects forward via an alternative script. Although my radicalism lies perhaps not in the overtly utopian and restless assertion of a parallel world, of continuity and synthesis, of actual possibility existent now, neither abstract nor concrete, but abstract and concrete simultaneously, very much part of the warp and weft of everyday life, the place beneath the place and the place behind the place. I am important not merely because I transform beauty from an attribute or quality to a problem, but because I understand desire to be no less problematic. To acknowledge the obdurate bedrock of the psyche, the unconscious, the dark continent of human subjectivity, not femininity, does not, by that token, absolve you from the political, indeed, the ethical task of decipherment 
demystification and ultimately transformation. I play both sides, constantly flaunting all values and affecting acts of sabotage amidst, amidst the insatiable consumption of contemporary culture. Whether consumer or supplier, enthusiastic or dismissive, it is impossible to remain impartial to my game. I leave you with a sense of abandonment. It is a kind of anti-space, an anti-monument to the romance of architecture possibly, or perhaps to the poetry of desolation that frames you, contains you, and against which you occasionally hit back. On another level, my desire to connect with other people and to connect them both with each other and with themselves through their performative participation in my ideas can be understood in existential terms as a repeated attempt to heal the ultimate pain of isolation. I am an open-ended play of fictions that sends you into a spasm of cosmic laughter, the liminal space-time of becoming, a play that enables you to recognize the fallacies in habitual modes of thought, to infiltrate their languages, to modify the meaning of their codes and shift the relationship between self and other. Amidst the cool and unnerving efficiency of 21st century communication systems, I am boisterous and persistent, a perverse logic within the freakonomics of the visual that leaves us irresistibly attracted, ravished and exuberant. I give pause for anticipation, to hold your breath, just for a moment and to rethink what it is you thought was certain. I simultaneously capture the world as you know it and rephrase it with a different order that, while far from certain, is undeniably new. By showing you my ability to co-opt and distort through my own vision, I demonstrate that I am not defined by a set of rules. Rather, I use rules as a critical tool, something to res resist audaciously rather than conform to. I am a diviner who frees what you know from its rigid taxonomical restraints. The rational world objectified as realistic and the perceptual world objectified as fictional are, in my cosmology and theophany, both illusions that must be dispersed as so much fog in order that another third world be reve revealed in an interzone, a material one that exists coevally and co-spatially alongside, or more properly put, interwoven with the other two. I have created a kind of daydream in which the palpable and the concrete are dissolved into a space of reverie and illusion, a space in which the past is reconfigured as a new location within the present. I am unadorned, even in my praise of beauty, even at my most extreme. My polemic is, I realize, completely devoid of fashion and while the world has changed my worth hasn't
one, 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 two, 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 one, two, three, four. I was sitting in the archive, wondering how to decide what to take as the departure point for my next performance. The curators had asked me to dig around and make some aspect of the gallery's past visible. But after several visits, it dawned on me that everything in the archive was and would always be in the present. I wasn't going to find great chunks of the past hiding, hiding away in here. I was, I realized, stuck between a brief and a hard place. My eyes swam across columns and rows of boxes I delved arbitrarily into filing cabinets. I opened folders and peered at shelves without prejudice and without a plan. The time and industry that the archive's stacks and repositories represent is immense. Each box contains evidence of many, many conversations and transactions driven by occult intentions and tailed by enigmatic results. We might turn to the exhibition catalogues for information. We might say, look, here is what has happened. But a reality will always overflow its photograph and those essays, well, as we know, they have been written by individuals with a questionable sense of proportion. And so I reckon we are going to need quite some presence of mind to reconstitute the archive, because here the geography of the world is compressed down to desktop proportions, and huge exertions have been filtered between sheaves of paper. We need to listen for the economics of materials, labor, and status humming in the strip lighting, and feel for annoyances, disappointments, and small victories in the sigh of a disturbed post-it note. I was sitting in the archive, thinking of all this which the, bo which the boxes could not contain, and of what was actually in them, which was mainly paper and ink. I thought of all the form filling and phone calling and letter writing and emailing and bank transferring and informing and requesting and ordering and reordering and cancelling and checking and cross-checking and proofreading and calculating and budgeting and all the repetitive strain injury and carpal tunnel syndrome and headaches and toothaches and muscle cramps and period pains and tumors and cysts. I could feel the world turning and hear the systems grinding. I sensed the itches and tingles of thousands of egos in my follicles, the weight of hierarchies in my bones and the flexing of influence in my ventricles. tried to think of the artists making their work, standing at easels, pacing studios, climbing mountains of bronze and marble in search of inner and outer truths. We all know that artists are restless, that creativity is feverish, an uprising of the body and soul. Art is not sedentary. But here in the gallery archive, all I could conjure were seated figures at desks, their only movement the flight of hands over telephones, typewriters, and computers. Here was a whole history of art that had been conducted, sitting down. The 
chair I was sitting on had become very warm. It started to tremble. It was a black wheeled office chair made of nylon, dragged up from the cheaper end of the commodity spectrum while claiming to preserve the lumber regions of lower middle management. Sitting rather imperiously next to it, as if dictating or keeping an eye on standards, was a director's chair of wood and linen. And stationed elsewhere about the room were four white bentwood ant-style chairs. The workers. Was it a coincidence, I thought, that there was, right here, a symbolic rendering of a top-down organizational power structure? The black nylon chair shook with enthusiasm beneath me, and somehow my buttocks could comprehend its syntax of rumbles and swivels. It's no coincidence at all, it told me. Please sit a while longer and let me show you a past that you could never have imagined. A long time ago, humans shared the earth with a species of elegant quadrupeds. These creatures had the social grace of deer and the fascinating variation of butterflies. They were peaceful creatures that lacked any desire for power or position. They laughed easily at another's jokes, not needing to tell a better one, and were happy to fall silent for hours if there was nothing particular to say. Any complaint they might have would escape them as ultra-fine dust to be borne away by breezes. Artists could sense the profundity of these creatures. They painted them as symbols of all that lies beyond representation. Saints would stand on tall pillars for days, months, and years in deference to them. Shamans and debutantes performed rituals and dances in honor and celebration. Over centuries, the creatures evolved into several, su several subspecies, each developing characteristics that people would identify with. Because these creatures appeared to cultivate human personalities, but not the capacity to bellyache or earbend, people felt they could dominate them. People drew on passive-aggressive methods of exploitation and humiliation and abused the creatures violently. After many centuries of patience and pain, the creatures withdrew deep inside themselves or fled to a parallel present. They left behind their physical forms, mere rhymes, solid and inanimate like wood, as monuments to our shame, which we did not feel. In fact, people didn't even notice. They thought that the creatures were becoming acquiescent. They thought they had domesticated them.
over time, people forgot that these creatures had ever been animate at all. They passed over into the category of objects like mold and chickens and slaves. People even began to believe that they had once long ago invented these objects themselves. devised way of recreating their bleak husks, but it was like trying to make a person out of meat and staples, or a revolution out of customer complaints. Something important was missing. Spurred on by dissatisfaction, people made endless new versions of these forms, experimenting with materials and something they dubbed design. But even the very latest designs were lacking. And still, today, we spend hours sitting alone or together in large rooms, wondering what it is. People made these manifold surrogates a signifier of taste and achievement. Most people kept small herds of them, like insensate pets, about their homes and places of work. They became addicted to sitting on them. Governments issued warnings against it, but the masses would protest by sitting on the floor for days and refusing to move if they were denied a steady supply of these reproduction exoskeletons of an extinct species. The addiction started to take its toll people became apathetic and quarrelsome. Often when standing after a spell of sitting, they would creak or crack about the knees or have a dizzy turn. And so eventually they stopped standing up at all. Minority agitators suspecting that a global conspiracy was at work urged the masses to stand up by singing rousing anthems. Extension 
Stabilization phase completed with all motions associated with the rising. <laughs> Governments turned the objects into weapons with which to punish those who had stood up for the wrong reasons, or who sat down differently, or who stood up to commit the wrong sort of act. Back in the archive, to say that I realized all of this all of a sudden would sound suspect, like the sort of convenient miracle a story should never rely on. But it was a sudden realization, a flash of consciousness that shot up through my anus and drew on all my senses at once. Through this unusual and exciting conduit of information, I also received an understanding that we should not judge these creatures by human standards. Our predicament is not their revenge, but our callousness. In fact, they are willing to return to guide us through these difficult times. Unaccountably compelled, I wheeled the chair across the floor towards a filing cabinet, and not without some stiffness and giddiness, stood to open the top drawer, which revealed its miraculously long expanse of suspended files each lodged full of sheets of plastic pockets stuffed with 35 mil slides. Labels perched atop the files like helpful birds. One sang sweeter than all the others. Furniture from painting, it piped, November 1983 to January 1984. Holding the slides up to the light, I could just make out chairs and tables and other familiar forms arranged in abstract spaces with dramatic lighting but the details were lost to me at this size. Take them, said the chair. This will be all the proof you need. So I smuggled the slides out of the archive for scanning and scrutinizing elsewhere. I waited for the scanner head to crawl slowly under the glass bed throwing its light about like a revelation. But what appeared on screen was not a bright, clear view of a chair, a stool, or a sofa. It was a painting, and not the original painting of which the furniture was a quotation, but a new one, an abstraction, a fuzzy, willful obscuration. So here, apparently, is evidence of this history. I have no idea what this means, nor what the moral of the story is, or the many morals, probably. But 
At a guess, there will be a thought to be had about constructing futures based on different pasts. And also one about the fact that even when we are alone, we are in company. And we should probably take it on board as well, that if we discharge our complaints like dust on the breeze, we too will likely become extinct. And so, in greater company than we realized when we arrived, the time has come to rise up and leave to end.